All right, peace and greetings, YouTubers. So, before I get to the foolery that Kanye has decided to stir up, I want to kind of have a different conversation, and I want people to understand that when it comes to anti-blackness, we are currently living in a cycle that continues to repeat itself. And I think a lot of people at this point kind of recognize and see that, but I think one of the things that has shifted in modern times really are kind of actually maybe three things. One of those things is the love of celebrity. Another one of those things is the urge for some to be in close proximity to whiteness, but not even just whiteness, but white spaces, and also feel that they belong in those spaces. And then I think a third component is there's some folks who are just like, forget it, I'm done, I'm checked out. They, they could care less. It's just about them, themselves, and they. The idea of looking at things through a collective perspective is out the window. So it's all about them and themselves, right? And so when I talk about this cycle, I wanna paint a picture. So we're gonna take a field trip back into time, shall we? So. Let us go to May 18th of 1980. There were two things taking place in the United States that were pretty big stories. Over on the West Coast, you have Mount St. Helens erupting, right? And remember we talked about the guy, Harry Truman, not the president, but there was a man named Harry Truman that lived on Mount St. Helens. And they kept telling the man, hey, you, you might want to get off. It's about to blow up. And he, I'm not leaving. I've been here for however many years. I'm not scared of the volcano. And then literally, he was pretty much vaporized when the pyroclastic flow showed up. But... 3,000 miles away on the other side of the country, very far to the south, Miami Metro, you have Liberty City, which is burning. And so the question becomes, why? Why is the city burning? Why is everybody, because this is a seven day riot. You know, people were like, I'm sick of this. You know, what, what triggered all that? So then we go into the layers and the details, because again, when we talk about a cycle, there are many components. It's not just about feelings that people have towards celebrities, but it's about everything that affects black people collectively. So let's jump into it. When you talk about a city like Miami, Miami was a city that was redlined just like pretty much every major metropolitan city in this country, whether it be LA, Seattle, Portland, Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, St. Louis, New York, Boston, you can name any city, there is evidence of redlining somewhere. Baltimore, it doesn't matter which city, every city was redlined pretty much. That's pretty much what laid out America. So Miami at that point in time was a very, very segregated city. It was to the point where up until the 1950s, black people could not own or operate any businesses in downtown Miami, not at all. And even when you get into the 1960s, there was an area called Hialeah where pretty much if you were a black person that worked in that side of town in the 1960s, you needed a special pass to be on that side of town. Kind of like apartheid in South Africa where you had to have a pass to go to certain segments of town and you had to have it on you at all times. Or of course, you would be stopped by the police. In addition to that, there was also a wall that was built to keep the city segregated. Black folks lived in their portion, white folks lived in their portion. And so, of course, for this current system that we're describing to work and operate smoothly, there needed to be enforcement. And so when you dig into the early origins of Miami, especially in the early 1900s, when you talk about the 1920s, in order to be on the police force, you had to have associations with the Klan. No associations with the Klan, you can't be a cop, right? And that would be something that would last up until the 1940s and 50s. But even by then, the practices and, and, and the traditions that would have come out of those police forces are now embedded and institutionalized within that force. Because think about it, if you have the Klan on the force, who's, pol you know, who's policing the Klan? No one. So of course, the idea of terrorism against black Americans, because remember, 1920s, if we just talk about 1919, which was a year of lots of what you call uprisings against black people by white mobs. You know, that was just in 1919. We get to 1920s. And again, you have the Klan who literally runs the police department. They have free reign to do whatever they want. So when it came to enforcing those rules and making sure that black folks stayed on their side of town, it, it, it was what it was. And mind you, this is not the Miami that we see today where it's a bit more diverse and you have different populations represented from all these different countries. It, Miami wasn't that yet. It was very black and white at that point in time, right? So anyway, getting back to my redlining conversation, there was an area called Overtown. Overtown is where the black folks lived, all right? However, Overtown was actually a thriving community, all right? They had their own booming economy. They had all these businesses and, and black professionals and their own doctors and schools and grocery stores and everything else like that. Kind of like its own version of Tulsa for Miami. You know what I mean? We, we've talked about and everybody's talked about Tulsa, Oklahoma, but there were lots of different cities all across the United States where black people collectively had their own town where they pretty much operated and owned the means of operation. And so those towns would flourish and of course, white anger, white mobs would go and burn those things down. As we got into the 1950s, instead of burning them down, there was another thing that came in that kind of took away those neighborhoods. Development. So, 1959, there is a man named Luther Brooks, 
And Luther Brooks owns a whole bunch of everything. Like, he's, he's rich, right? And so he figures, you know, we need to expand into Miami. Like, we need to go up to that northern side because pretty much that's where Overton or Overtown is, right? I was watching Living Single the other day. That's why I said Overton. But anyway, um, you know, they want to expand. We need to expand. And so at the same time, what's happening in the United States as we come into the 1950s, right? You have the creation of the interstate freeway systems, right? I-95 runs from Florida to Maine. Right. And so they decide, well, you know, in order to develop Miami, we need to, you know, make sure that we have access to I-95 so people can get to these new areas that we want to develop because, you know, we want to have more businesses and we want to become a big tourist city and, you know, have people coming in from California and, and from Nebraska and, and, and from Utah just to come see how great our city is. And so we're going to go ahead and expand I-95. Where does I-95 end up being built? right smack on top of Overtown, which means we need to now go ahead and displace a bunch of people. And usually in an ideal world, when there's some kind of development or some kind of project going on and the developers or the business owners need a specific plot of land, but it's occupied by someone else, they usually go to that community or to that owner, whoever that tenant is and say, hey, listen, um, we have this project we're doing and your property sits right smack in the middle of our vision. So here's the thing. We're going to offer you this really great package deal of this amount of money to make sure that you're able to get on your feet and start over and continue living a prosperous life. And so how much do you want for the land? What, what's a deal that we can make? But oh no, not in this situation because again, these are just black folks. So who cares? We'll just do anything to them. And so here comes that big monster called eminent domain. Understand. Something like eminent domain has been weaponized against so many black communities all across this country. I did a video, it's one of my in the news episodes. It's one of the episodes where I talk about the, the Biden administration giving the bell out to disenfranchised vote, not disenfranchised voters, disenfranchised farmers. Sorry, there's just so much we go through. I get all the titles mixed up, it's so much. Um, the disenfranchised farmers, and mainly these were a lot of black farmers who were left out of even just the bailouts from the Trump administration because one, they were not qualified as USDA farms, which is another conversation, another story. But anyway, in that video, we talk about how pretty much a lot of our malls, freeways, a lot of big projects were pretty much, they became a thing because of eminent domain. And so a lot of people became collateral to these projects. And so when it comes to eminent domain, it's your state and local government or federal government saying, hey, we see that you live here, but there's a project that is for the greater good of society for the greater good of your area. And pretty much, we're just gonna bulldoze whatever you have because we're gonna take that land. We might give you a settlement, but it's not gonna be anything that's gonna make you whole. It's not gonna be anything that's gonna put you into a space to leave you where you left off. You're probably worse off, and never mind your whole community and all that. We're taking all of that because again, we, we need to build this freeway. In an effort to correct blighted conditions, city lands are re-evaluated and undesirable areas are leveled to the ground. And so pretty much they build this freeway system and 20,000 residents of Overtown are displaced. That's 50% of the town. And let me tell you how trifling it was. The trifling part is they made sure to tear down 2nd and 3rd Avenue, okay? Those were the two streets where all the booming black businesses were in Overtown. That was all of the livelihood of the town. So think about what it would be like for the people who are still in Overtown who did not get bulldozed over, right? Literally the livelihood and the commerce of the town is now gone. So there goes the investment. There goes the wealth that has been accumulated for the next generation that would grow up to live in Overtown. That also affects things like the property values, the property taxes, which indirectly will affect what's happening with how much money is going into the schooling. And so long story short, they displaced 20,000 people and they pushed them into Liberty City, right? So Liberty City pretty much at this point in time is still a very white section of town. Now with the whole segregation, of course, they don't have people just all mixed together, but they're starting to put black people in pockets of Liberty City. So what do you think the white people started doing, right? White people are getting mad. What are you putting those people over here for? They're going to bring our property values down. And so here comes the white rage and also the white flight, something you'd also see as we came into the 1970s after the Fair Housing Act came into fruition. And so you started seeing black folks now able to move into different neighborhoods. And you saw white folks say, I'm not living with those people. I'm out of here. We're, we're gone. Right. And so Liberty City becomes this very interesting area where there's a lot of change taking place because also Understand Miami is shifting culturally because now you're having new populations come into the area as we get into the 60s and the 70s. So you're starting to see a lot of Haitian families come into, my, uh, come into Liberty City. You're starting to see people from Jamaica coming in, people from Cuba, people from all these different places, Venezuela coming to the area. The area is getting more diverse. White folks are not having it. What are all these people doing up in here? And the crazy part is even for those who were immigrating into the area, depending on how they looked, it would determine how they were treated, where they would live, and what opportunities that they would have. And so... 
you get into the space of Liberty City where now there's white rage, there's all these different populations that are starting to grow and try to flourish in these different areas. And again, we still have this policing system that hasn't gone anywhere. And now you incorporate that white rage and that fear of the unknown, which really isn't fear, it's just a conversation of fear of losing power. So we're gonna pretend we're scared of the people that don't look like us. And so you, of course, get the more aggressive policing. Very aggressive because again, these are now the children of former Klansmen or current Klansmen and some of them are still in the Klan. These are the children of the racist Klan members. These are the children that are now the police that are, you know, their dad was in the Klan. Their dad was in whatever little movement. And even when you take the Klan out of the picture, like I said, the practices and ideologies and viewpoints are still there. And so now you get into the space where you have Liberty City and Overtown, two areas where as you have the white flight, as you have the development that destroys what was already there, you lose the investment in both communities. What happens when there's no investment, when there's less stores, when there's less opportunity, when there's less things in regards to, you know, access to education, access to good food, access to good health care, access to just freaking clean water. So you start to see the rise in crime and everything else like that. And so if there's a rise in crime, that means the police got to get even tougher. And so let's fast forward to where that leads us. Let's jump a generation. So we come to December 17th of 1979. And there's a black man named Arthur McDuffie, former Marine, and he has just had a great time with all his people. He's on the way home. It's 1.51 a.m., all right? He is two blocks from home, two blocks. He gets to the red light. No one's there. Light's taking too long. He's on his motorcycle. He's like, you know what, let me, nobody's looking. I'm gonna just go through the red light, right? So he goes through the red light, thinking nobody would see. He even pops a wheel, you know, shh, living it up, right? Oh no. There was a police officer who saw him. So the police officer tries to stop him. He doesn't really stop. So he keeps going. There's this eight minute pursuit. He eventually stops right before the freeway and is like, you know what, I don't want this smoke today. Gets out, hands up, gets off the bike. What do you think happened? Them police were like, oh, <laughs> you ain't want to stop, huh? We're going to show you. And so you have 10 officers who beat this man unconscious. Now, mind you, while he was beaten, he was cuffed face down on the ground. So he is beaten by these 10 officers. He dies from his injuries because he's beaten unconscious. What makes the story sketchy right away is that it took the police officers four hours, again, four hours, to report what happened to the lead internal investigator. Just understand, anytime the police kill somebody, they're supposed to inform the lead internal investigator because that's the way that the police are supposed to police themselves, right? And mind you, this lead internal investigator was also a black woman. And so what do you think happened in those four hours between this man dying and laying on the sidewalk and bleeding out and the lead internal investigator finally being informed about what just happened within their department? The police are putting together this story of what they're going to say happened. And so this was the story that they had. They said pretty much, yeah, we tried to stop him. He wouldn't stop. And so he crashed and, you know, he hit his head and the helmet came off and he just skidded on the side of the road. And when we got there and tried to help him, he just got up and attacked us like a madman. Doesn't that story sound so familiar to many of the, as the sirens are going while I'm telling this, this, this is good optics, this is great, keep it up. I don't know if y'all can hear that or not. But anyway, doesn't it sound just like many of the stories we've heard where the police say, oh, some act of God happened, but that person was so strong and they still kept trying to attack, I feared for my life. So Mike Brown, we've shot him a few times, but you know, he got shot in the head, oh, and just kept coming, oh, like the Hulk, he's so strong. So this man, Arthur McDuffie, who allegedly has now fallen off of a bike, the helmet is coming off, he's skid on the side of the road, and he's just so empowered and so strong, he got up and decided to attack 10 police officers. That's the story that the police put out. But I, I, not so fast, because then when they got into the investigation, there were lots of loopholes in the story. First of all, when we just talk about the motorcycle, the damages to the bike didn't quite match the story that the police were telling. Remember, the police said he was driving, he didn't stop, he fell over, and the bike would skid all down the street. That was supposed to be the damage to the bike, but the damages did not match up. You want to know why? Because the police then decided they were going to beat the bike with their helmets. This is after they've had the four hours to figure out their plan, and now they're executing it. So they used McDuffie's helmet to beat the bike. Then they used batons and nightsticks, beat the bike down. Another officer got in the car, drove over the bike. They took the keys from the bike, threw it on the roof at a nearby building and everything else like that. And so nothing quite aligned. And then just to make sure that they got the job done, when the bike was at the impound lot, an officer, officer literally hopped over the fence, snuck inside, and beat the bike some more just to make sure that the job was done. All right? And so in that element, things did not quite align or add up. And then you had the medical examiner, a man named Donald White, who was like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. The injuries to this man do not align with what y'all said. When it came to the details in regards to the injuries to Arthur McDuffie, 
The medical examiner said he had the injuries of somebody who would have fallen off of a five-story building, all right? They beat him so bad, right? One, when they beat him in the back of the head with the nightclubs and the nightsticks, they split his skull open. Secondly, blood was splattered nearly four feet away from the body. He was beaten so bad that his facial features were unrecognizable because his head was so swollen. They could not even find this man's neck because that's how swollen he was. His eyes had pretty much popped out and literally they had to drill bolts into the man's head in order to release the pressure that was around his brain. Pretty much, and this is a quote from the medical examiner, pretty much he died because of the destruction of his underlying brain. That's how bad they beat this man. And just to highlight the lack of transparency that existed within the police department, the chief of police didn't even know about Arthur McDuffie dying for a whole four days. He found out from a journalist. The journalist is asking him the questions about Arthur McDuffie and he, whoa, oh, I didn't even know that happened. What? Whoa. Oh, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? Like, he didn't even know. That's how, when it comes to regulating and making sure that there's any kind of protocol in that police department, it was non-existent. And so anyway, 10 police officers are charged. And the charges vary from, you know, manslaughter, tampering with evidence, all kinds of different things. And they decide that they need to move the trial to Tampa because if we have it in this community of people who are pissed off about what has happened to one of their own, you know, it, 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 they might not get a fair trial. The police aren't going to get a fair trial. So they move it to Tampa. And understand, Tampa in 1980 at this point is pretty much an all white city. It's a pretty white town, right? And so the jury is composed of nothing but middle-aged white men. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when it came to the funeral of Arthur McDuffie, he had an open casket. You see how these things are almost like a cycle because this automatically would make you think of Emmett Till, right? And so, you know, he has the open casket funeral. That in itself is sad enough just to see the clips of even the mother doing an interview and, and to hear those kind of cries. It, it's something that, there's certain sounds you just never forget. But getting back to the trial, what do you think happened? All right? They moved this trial to Tampa, and this, these 10 officers that are on trial for different various offenses, and, you know, it's an all-white male jury. They literally had this four-week trial, and they had a verdict ready in two hours and 40 minutes. Not guilty. Everybody's free. Nobody was, was convicted of a single charge. Everybody got off. And then this is where you even see the cycle. Because remember when we talked about Ferguson? And remember after it was decided that nothing was going to happen to Darren Wilson? And all of a sudden, the, the, you know, the, I think that was the chief of police or somebody in charge did that press conference and just talked all this trash about how people overreacted and the hands up don't shoot with some nonsense and blah, 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 blah. And so while you're watching it on one camera angle, you see him giving his speech. On the other camera angle, you see Ferguson and going up in flames. It's literally the same thing where now the police officers are talking trash about the trial, how it was a waste of time, how it was all a sham. They're owed an apology, all these different things. And even to see their reactions of them high-fiving and patting each other on the back like they did a good job, where they literally just got off for killing somebody over a red light. Because, okay, people can say, oh, well, he didn't stop. Listen, just to make this point go further i'm just gonna have for the rest of you know the few minutes that i'm on here well it might be more than a few minutes i'm just gonna have some footage of white people resisting arrest or fighting the police or doing whatever they don't want to do and living to tell about it okay there's that and so one of the things that takes place is of course this triggers the riot so december or i'm sorry may 17th 1980 it's on and popping in liberty city the residents are just tired of it because what happened with that trial just highlights all of the atrocities that have been happening to the people in that community for decades. Everything from being displaced, having to deal with the segregation, having to deal with the over-policing, having to deal with the divestment from the air, like all of that. And so literally people have had enough. And so it makes you wonder because that's one riot that people don't even remember. That's one that's not even a part of the national conversation anymore. And then what happens when we just go a decade later? Literally almost the same scenario with Rodney King in LA, where again, you talk about the history of the black experience in LA and the nonsense and everything from the Watts riots back in the 60s and all the things that used to take place that worked against black people collectively. You talk about the war on crime coming out of the Nixon era, which translated into the war on drugs from the Reagan era era and how black families in the 80s, the 70s, and 90s dealt with so much nonsense from the LAPD. And now the difference with this situation with Rodney King is we have it on tape. It's on video this time. And also, media has shifted. When everything happened with Arthur McDuffie, CNN was not a network yet. Okay, CNN would literally become a network one month after the riots. So when it came to national news and different stories taking place, a lot of times when people would say, this is what's happening, this is what's happening, it often did not even make it to the mainstream news because at that point in time, there were no major news networks. CNN was not a thing. Fox News, ugh, 
was not a thing. MSNBC was not a thing. You got your news from ABC, Nightly News, CBS, or NBC, but that was only going to be a 30-minute window of information, so they're trying to cover everything that's happened across the nation. And right now, Mount St. Helens was blowing up, so that's where they need to focus. And so, you know, they have all of these different things taking place, but now with the LAPD and Rodney King, it's on video. So everybody just knows this man, you know, them four officers are going to jail. They, they have to be have to it's on video and you, it's an extended video if you've ever watched that video it goes on and on it ain't just like a two second clip with a pop pop and that was it no they beat this man down and if you saw what his face looked like when it all was over with fortunately he lived at that time but man so everybody in LA just knew it, it's gonna be fine we, we'll be fine what happened they get off what happens LA goes up in flames. The people of LA have had enough. They're, they're tired of the nonsense. And when you talk about what happened in both communities, going back to Liberty City, one of the things that also took place is the residents were kind of tired of the interactions with the police because there had been many instances where police got off and, and, and would literally murder. You had a police officer shoot a black man for peeing outside of a warehouse. He put the gun to the man's head, claimed he was just playing, but somehow the trigger went off, killed the man. You had a police officer who stopped a, a black little girl, molested her, and then got probation. And then never even had the, he was, he was ordered to pay for the girl's therapy and everything. He skipped town. He ain't never had, he skipped town. Oh, and by the way, all the police officers that, that killed Arthur McDuffie, of course, were reinstated. And so when you look at the parallel and go back to L.A., what happened with L.A.? Remember that black girl that was, that was killed by the Korean store owner because the store owner thought that she was shoplifting and she wasn't. And they literally killed the girl. Like, so you have two communities that are sick of the B.S., Right. And so people uprise, people revolt, people, they got to release their anger because they feel like they're being unheard. Right. And so when I talk about this cycle, this is what I'm talking about, because you're constantly seeing a cycle repeat itself. And even going back to Liberty City again, you had a teacher, somebody who was trying to do well in the community. The police raid the wrong house, beat the teacher down. The teacher eventually dies from his injuries. Black man killed him. You know, that's the nonsense that people have been saying. And it's not just a Liberty City or an L.A. thing. It's all over the country. And that's just the conversation of police brutality. OK, we talk about the cycle that we're talking about. There, there's an Arthur McDuffie in every city. You know, there's a Rodney King in every city. That's why with the emergence of social media, this is why you've heard of so many additional people, whether it's Freddie Gray or, or Philando Castile or Eric Garner or Sean Bell. Like we could just name person after person after person or Sandra Bland. And it just goes on and on and on. And so when you're talking about the cycle, what are the cycles we see? We see a system where there's a system that's built to purposely disenfranchise black people collectively. In addition to that, while living in that system, they have to be terrorized by a police force. They have to be terrorized by anti-blackness. They have to be terrorized by white rage. They have to deal with job discrimination, housing discrimination, the fact that there's no investment into the schools, the fact that depending on your zip code, it's, it's gonna play a role into the kind of education that you're gonna get. The conversations of what happens when it comes to infrastructure and how a lot of times black communities are targets for pretty much programs and ideas that are going to make some people rich but disenfranchise the people so then you get the flint water crisis or you get what's happening in mississippi you get what's happening with infrastructure where the power grids in certain neighborhoods are not the same as the power grids in others where you talk about houston and the neighborhoods that are prone to flooding in comparison to other neighborhoods like it goes story after story after story after story because again these are the cycles that we're living under and you see it repeat itself with each and every generation but now that we're in these modern times we're now in a space where things that were once thought to be collectively understood Stood, it's up in the air because people people are either distracted or they latch on to the idea of celebrity and this is where we get to Kanye so when it comes to somebody like a Kanye West he's an agent of chaos he's just in the way black folks have enough that we're dealing with collectively you got to deal with gentrification and being displaced and being taxed out of your neighborhoods you got to deal with environmental racism the fact that there's all these different areas specifically where black people are heavily concentrated as far as their neighborhood and there's no green space no grass no trees no water and then they wonder why all the kids got asthma duh it's because they're breathing in nothing but dust metal and glass and then you even get to the issues with housing you keep seeing these stories where black people can't even get proper appraisals for how much their property's worth because somebody's trying to lowball them or they're trying to not sell them anything. You see the job discrimination, the fact that black people are still fighting just to climb up into the corporate world or into the different worlds and the different industries. When you talk about the wages on a dollar, the fact that black women are getting what, 56 cents to every white man's dollar and black men are getting what, 80 cents to every white man's dollar. When you talk about the policy that's constantly written to work against black people collectively, everything is always coming from a punitive standpoint or something where everything is being stripped away and we're 
were forced to play these political games and somehow get behind politicians that don't even really do much for us, but we're in a space where our back is up against the wall and we're literally voting as a defensive mechanism, not even to get what we want, but just to make sure that things don't get worse than they already are. Then you got to deal with the conversation of food deserts. I've mentioned a million times before that for years, right here in D.C., Ward 7 and Ward 8 had, or Ward 8 had one grocery store for 200,000 people. You know, like literally, like that's the kind of nonsense, all right? And then even in regards to education, you're seeing what's happening with them pulling money out of the schools, specifically the schools where black people happen to live. And then come the punitive policy, the no child left behind, the implementation of new standardized testing, all these different ways to keep gutting and chopping the school down because the end goal really is to privatize our public school system. And who's going to be collateral when they start public or privatizing a public school system? The people that can't afford to go to these schools of choice or go to these different institutions that people would have to pay for because of course wealthy white people will get to put their children in institutions poor white people are going to have to put their children into the schools with the poor black kids or the middle class black kids and they're going to feel some kind of way then you're going to have the cultural violence taking place within the academic system and we already know that children are already heavily policed in the classroom all right there's a reason why nine-year-old little girls are not treated like nine-year-old little girls in public schools when they're black they're already seen as adults and they're seen as aggressive which is why there's a higher suspension rate it also jumps into the fact that when it comes to special education black children are prone to be are at a higher level to be put into a special education program, not because of how they cognitively understand things, but because teachers feel that they don't know how to manage their behavior. And so you have these punitive policies that you keep creating to put black children in because you don't understand how to deal with them culturally. And then we even get into the issues with cutting of the programs, all these different programs that are out there to help people get on their feet. They're constantly trying to cut every time you turn around, right? We have the issues with punitive laws and the judicial system and how, again, we're still overrepresented in the prisons, not because black people are more more violent or do more things than other groups of people, but because the system ensures that there's always going to be extra cells for black folks because, hey, there's these privatized prisons. They make a lot of money. But let's keep finding ways to get more people into these cells. So we'll over-police certain neighborhoods, but we'll ignore other ones, all right? You have the voter disenfranchisement and all that's, take, that's taking place. You have what's happening with black farmers and how 94 percent of their land has been taken by the U.S. government or it's been sold off or it's been stolen and so black people have a fraction of the land that they had just a hundred plus years ago. When you talk about the disenfranchisement within health care and how black people don't even have the same access to health care that white people have in addition to what you see with child mortality and mother mortality rates when it comes to childbirth and the different things that take place in that space. You have the conversation about the wealth gap. You have the conversation about even how black people are not treated the same when it comes to sexual assaults when they go and report it. We could be here all day with all the things Things that affect black people collectively in the United States. So when it comes to Kanye, I don't have time for his inflated ego because the man is consistent at being inconsistent. You know, when it comes to black folks, he wants to be Malcolm X on Monday, and then by Monday at 12 o'clock, he switches over to Clarence Thomas. Then he's Joe Lostin an hour later. And an hour later, he's on Fox News talking about how everything is just a joke, and he, he did White Lives Matter because it was going to be a funny joke. He wanted to get people talking. And then an hour later, he wants black people to get behind him because he don't like the way that Kim was raising his black daughters, and so on and so forth. I'm not playing these games. Like, I just ate. I don't have time to be on a roller coaster with you, so I'm good. You go ahead and ride off into the distance and do your kind of nonsense but really the smoke that I have is more so for the people that move funny when it comes to Kanye and they keep enabling him and giving him a pass and that also includes the general public who always wants to try and justify the nonsense because again going back to that conversation we had where you have the people who have a love of celebrity but you also have people who want to be the face of intelligence but are not intelligent they don't have the range for the conversation. This is what I like to call the I told you so brigade. They never tell you anything. Yeah, but, but, but as soon as something hits the fan, I tried to tell y'all, I told you so. And when you give them the floor to share the insight, the knowledge, the wisdom that they claim they have, they give you nothing. Or it's something that's so outlandish and then they try to say, you, you, you're you not even on that same wave. You're not ready for that conversation. I'm ready. Let's have it. Go ahead. School me. And then, get, then when you get to that, that part, it's like, oh, no, no you, you got to do your research. You got to look it up. I mean, y'all y'all got to wake up. I'm like, oh, y'all niggas is stubborn. I'm like, man, y'all know how to work somebody's nerves. And that's the issue that I have. So folks can be serious about everything else all day. But then when it comes to anti-blackness or things that affect black people collectively, now it's okay for the mind games to begin. Now y'all y'all got to just get into the maze of Kanye's mind to understand because I'm there with him. Y'all just not. Okay, well, you two go over there and be stupid together then. We don't have time. And so that's the issue that I have. And then the other thing, because some folks keep saying, oh, no, y'all need to free the shackles. You got to free, be a free thinker. That's the other thing. Free thinkers. We're in this era of free thinkers. And my question is, how come every free thinker that has the loudest voice is only a free thinker when it comes to justifying anti-blackness and white nationalism? That's the only time you hear them. Because in my own head, 
If I'm thinking of what I would consider a free thinker to be, it would be somebody who just goes so far against the grain, they can't even maneuver or matriculate through everyday society. So they go and move out in a tent out in the woods somewhere in Montana because they can't be around everybody. They got to go off grid. You know, they, they collecting rainwater and trying to get to the fifth dimension. That's what I would have thought a free thinker was. But no, y'all definition of the free thinkers are the same people who go to the same brunches, the same parties, drink the same Casamigos, watch the same sports games, go to the same concerts, watch the same TV shows, wear the same clothes, do everything like everybody else. But when it comes to anti-blackness, all of a sudden they have a, an abstract thought. I'm like, all of y'all, sit down somewhere. I don't have the energy for it. And like, honestly, the fact that people kept trying to say, no, he's just, he's trying to get y'all to think. Kanye is not that deep. He ain't even playing with a full deck, okay? I don't even know if he has the right cards in the deck. He got a skip bow card. He got a phase 10 card, some uno cards. Taboo talking about let's play speed. Get out of my face. And so the issue that I have, like Mendon told you he don't read. And even when he gave the correlation as to why, that didn't even make sense. It's like eating Brussels sprouts. Okay, this is y'all genius. Yeah, I'm going to let y'all and y'all genius. I mean, and, and I think the part that I have the most smoke for is... The fact that Kanye had the nerve to respond to a collective hurt with an inflated ego that's boosted by white acceptance, that's where I draw the line. You know, and, and again, think about it. Any time this man gets called out, what does he do? He highlights what he has or what somebody else doesn't have. He ignores the actual issue that people are, are bringing to the table. And so that's why I'm just like, I'm good. I am so good. So good. Y'all can have it. Y'all enjoy and have a good time. And for the folks who are like, well, so are you saying white lives don't matter? Understand, white people collectively, stop centering yourselves in everybody else's struggle. Because that you guys already have everything. And the reason everybody else is struggling collectively is because of y'all. It is what it is. You know, if we want to have this conversation of police brutality, yes. Are there instances where white people are, are treated terribly by the police? Of course. But what happens? The system does its thing and works in favor of those white victims. Those police are, are held accountable. Things happen all in the name of whiteness. Black people don't get that same luxury. The things that black people are fighting for is the bare minimum. All of those crazy things I listed earlier in regards to things that we have to deal with, those are things, white people don't have to deal with any of that, all right? And so when black people are collectively just trying to get the bare minimum, there are a lot of white people in that collective who think that all of a sudden their privileges are being challenged. And that happens because when you live your life as being the standard, Everything else is supposed to be beneath you. So when anybody else just gets what they deem are a gain, which for black people would just be the bare minimum, oh, finally got clean water, yay. You know, that seems like somebody's losing their livelihood because again, when your standard has been privileged, anytime somebody who's getting the bare minimum gets anything and gets to a space where they can almost get to your standard, all of a sudden you feel like your privilege has been challenged. And that's why you see white people getting pissed off anytime you hear any conversation about police brutality. And this is not a conversation about Black Lives Matter, the organization. Understand anti-police brutality movements have been a thing before Black Lives Matter. If you follow me, I've said a million times, I'm not a part of any organization. It's me, myself, and I over here. I believe in collective community, but I believe in doing it in different ways and different levels. That's why I ran a community center for a decade and some change. And so everybody has their own way of doing things, but understand, stop centering yourselves in everybody else's oppression and trying to make an oppression that doesn't exist because you guys are the people who carry the power within that system. All right, I, yeah, I don't know which y'all in this Kanye. <laughs> this is the last time I'm speaking on him, by the way, because I said that on Tuesday, and then here we are again. I just don't have the energy for it. And the fact that literally going back to that conversation of the cycle, I think what's happened now is celebrities have kind of been sprinkled into that cycle to operate as agents of chaos. And so now we're in a space where celebrity culture has affected a lot of people's cognitive dissonance. They're just in some nonsense. They will latch onto anything. And that's why you're starting to see, again, like I said, things that were once collectively understood by black people in regards to what is not good for the community, what's good for the community. Now stuff like that is up in the air. And so y'all tell me. I, 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 I can't. By the way, there's a really great documentary called When Liberty Burns that pretty much talks about the Arthur McDuffie situation and the riots and everything like that. It's a really great documentary. It came out a few years ago, so definitely check that out. It's on Amazon. I think it's also on like YouTube. You can pay for it. It's like 2 or $3 if you rent it. And so definitely check that out. And so these celebrities, like I told y'all, there's no celebrity that is exempt from smoke. I don't care how great a remix is. It is what it is. Anyway, Sherry Two Cents, I'm out. Subscribe.